Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk and this is episode 107 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a great discussion with Leela Salisbury for this week's episode. And this is the first episode of a two-part series with the Salisbury family. Leela is with us this week, and next week we'll speak with her 15-year-old daughter, Katerina, for part two of the series. It's going to be so great to hear from both of them and hear their different perspectives and their reflections on the loss of the same person, Leela's husband and Katerina's dad. And I think this is such a great way to continue with Children's Grief Awareness Month. Every November is, of course, Children's Grief Awareness Month. Uh, In fact, I started this podcast in November of 2018, just in time for that month and in uh, honor and recognition of Children's Grief Awareness Month. Uh, So last week, we had a terrific discussion with Lane Pease Hendricks and Nancy Kreisman from Kate's Club. And I wanted to continue the discussion this week with, like I said, this two-part discussion with a mother and daughter pair from the same family, which which I hope will be interesting and helpful for you guys. Okay, I hope you enjoy my discussion today with Leela Salisbury. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Widowed Parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Widowed Parent. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Leela Salisbury, founder and director of the Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families. Leela is a widowed parent of a teen, and she's joining us today from Lexington, Kentucky. Leela, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very excited to be talking with you today. Well, you know, I've really been looking forward to this for so many reasons, including because this is my first chance to talk with somebody in Kentucky who has resources for listeners and families there, and I want to hear all about the grief center that is Uh, I think by the time this interview airs, it will have just started operations. Right. Um, So very close to to being ready for that. Um, And I'm also excited, I should say to listeners, this is the first in a two-part series about the Salisbury family. So I'm very much looking forward. This is going to be part one uh, with Leela, who is the mom in the family. And later this afternoon, so for listeners, it'll be next week's show. Please tune in. I am talking with your 15-year-old daughter, Katerina, for her perspective on your family's uh, journey. So this is going to be really fun. Yes, and and it'll be fascinating for me and, and hopefully the listeners, too, to hear. I think you'll probably hear some of the same events narrated in very different ways, or you'll feel like, are they both talking about the same thing? Because our factual <laughs> recall of how certain things unfolded, especially you know, in the first year or two after her dad's death, we may have completely different takes on it. And and partly for a while, you know, when we'd be talking about something, I would find myself saying, no, no, that's that's not how it went, you know, and we'd kind of, you know, get in a little argument about it. And finally, you know, it occurred to me, I'm like, you know, for each of us, what we remember is true. Um, and, you know, there, there is that whole grief brain thing that goes on. So I will fully admit I, I was probably a completely faulty narrator for, you know, a good year or two <laughs> after Bill died. So, you know, that may be part of it. Or, you know, part of it, too, is, you know, what I was trying to do and hoped I was achieving that may not have felt like I was actually achieving those things to Katerina. So uh, you'll, you'll get her version uh, of events, too. And, and that's, part of it. It took it took me a little while, but finally I realized within the first six months, our grief journeys were going to be very different, even mm-hmm. though it was, you know, we had lost the same person, but there, you know, and there would be some commonalities and some intersections, but also for a lot of reasons, they were different and I needed to kind of respect that um, and, and go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Good. Well, you've teed up so many topics here <laughs> that I can't wait to dive into because this is this is this is going to be great. Um, let's just back up though first for listeners and set the stage a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit before everything changed when life was sure. normal a long, long time ago? Um, tell us a little bit about your family and kind of what normal looked like. 
Right. So we were uh, we were all from Kentucky, but uh, at the time we're living in Jackson, Mississippi. So 11 hour drive from you know, our closest family members. Um, I was running a university press and my husband, uh, when we moved to Kentucky, actually took the role of the stay at home dad. Um, so he was home with Katerina, she was in a school Montessori program, but, you know, he would take her to, you know, her music lessons, dance, you know, he was kind of doing all that stuff while I was working and I had to travel some. So, um, you know, it, it worked. He did the cooking, you know, and so and I was nice. able to spend a lot of, a lot of time, uh, you know, taking care of my job, but also, you know, when I was home, you know, I could spend all weekend, you know, focused on Katerina. Um, and we were in Mississippi for eight years, about four years into our time there. Um, uh, my husband died by suicide. You know, I had been having some problems um, and, you know, they're, they're probably, and I know you've recently had a discussion about suicide. You know, there were, some signs and I was worried um, and trying to do, you know, everything I could to, to convince him to, to get help. Um, and, and once he died, then figuring out how to navigate that with a five-year-old, um, you know, do you tell them exactly what happened? How does a five-year-old understand suicide? You know, this is one of the things that if I had to do it over, I might do differently at the beginning. Um, uh, we told her it was a car accident. Um, and I remember once we started going to um, grief support uh, group at the Fletcher Center in, there in Jackson, and I, we can talk more about, you know, grief center models. I was so grateful for the Fletcher Center because literally, you know, again, the closest family was 11 hours away. We had nobody there. It was just me. And that, that became a, a safe haven. But I started going to groups there. And I remember the first time I went, you know, I, I said he died in a car accident. Like I was, you know, there was such a stigma even with me to the suicide death. I was afraid. I didn't feel comfortable <laughs> saying this that. Is in the, when you, when you went to the adults group at the grief center mm -hmm. and your first, like, I'm introducing myself and, and you told them that it was a car accident. Yes. Uh, and can you tell us about that? Like, how did that feel? Well, it was interesting because again, somehow I'm always like the first one picked to go, you know, so <laughs> I'd never been in this space before. I'd literally never been in a support group before. And, right. you know, for, for your listeners who have been in one, um, you know, you go in, hi, I'm Leela. My husband died by, and then, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and I it, probably at that point, only literally, you know, my very closest friends and, and family and that probably not even all the family um, sort of knew because we were trying to figure out how to handle this with Katerina. And so, you know, people in town didn't know, coworkers didn't really know. Um, so, I, you know, I just I went with the car accident story and then literally the three people who went after me all introduced themselves and went on to say they'd lost somebody by suicide. Mm. And I remember driving home after that meeting, like, oh boy, I gotta, I, I have to own up in the next group. Like I owe them that. And I, I was so grateful um, that, you know, a twist of fate with timing had put me in the room with them. Um, because, you know, I, I realized I'm like, I've got to, you know, be, be honest uh, about this. And what was interesting, how it unfolded. So it was probably a year and a half, maybe two years later that I told my daughter how he really died. Mm -hmm. And during those two years sitting in the adult groups, it was so easy for me to hear because I, I was not the only one who did this. That there'd be other families, you know, who would come in over time and say, "Oh, well, it was a suicide," but we're not telling them that. And usually, they were like older kids, and or you know, it was a death maybe that had been covered in the newspaper or something. And you know, I would be thinking, "Oh, that is absolutely the wrong way to handle it." You know, what's that old saying? It's you know easier to see the splinter in your neighbor's eye than the log in your own eye. It was uh. exactly that. Like I could see like. Oh no, you know, you guys should not be handling it at all that way. Um, and yet there, there I was doing the exact same thing. So finally, after a couple of years, you know, I realized it was just weighing on my mind all the time. And I called up a therapist who'd been recommended to me 
by somebody at the Fletcher Center who worked with kids a lot. And I remember calling him and say, I just want to come in for an appointment with you. I feel like I need to have this conversation with my daughter, but I also need to talk to somebody about it beforehand. Is this, am I doing this for me or am I doing it for her? Mm. Um, you know, and ultimately the answer was both of us and it was something I needed to do. Uh, and, and looking back, I don't know. You know, I, I say that's probably one of the big things I would have done differently. Um, but I'm also grateful that I went ahead, you know, within a few years and did have that different conversation with her. Um, mm. And she was angry. And I knew, I, you know, I was not looking forward to it. So I'm like, she is going to be mad. And, you know, they're going to be trust issues. <laughs> and she was like seven by this point, maybe. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And so I, I remember literally the day I introduced this conversation, we're driving home from Girl Scouts. Mm. And, and for years afterwards, she's like, mom, that was the worst way to have this conversation. You've ridden, you're driving home from Girl Scouts. Like, what was wrong <laughs> with you? And, you know, I felt bad about it for a while. And then finally it occurred to me and I said to her, honestly, there's no great way to have the conversation. Your dad died by suicide, you know, there is no perfect or even good form. I mean, there can be mm. worse forms of that, I guess. Um, mm. But, you know, so that I, I finally started to give myself a little grace in that area because I'm like, it's, you know, my copy of the chapter on suicide and widowed parenting just got lost. You know, my copy of the parent handbook, you know, <laughs> was not available. I'm just going to make it up. Right, right. As best I can, you know, with with a lot of group support and you know therapist advice and all that. But um, yeah. you know, it it was never going to be good, even if it was necessary. Right. So. Well, so and it's interesting to me that you said you know, anger, trust issues, because this this is what I hear from interviewing professionals. Right, this is exactly the reason why they recommend telling yes. the truth, even if the kids are very young. Right, and they say. Because you don't want to have you know, developed trust issues because the, the ability for the child to trust their surviving parent is, is so critical. And so you can hear that talked about in the abstract and think, okay, that makes sense. Right. And so to hear you say, yeah, this was my experience. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, it, it, yes. And it, it was fascinating, you know, getting to hear again, other people literally narrate in my presence, the same set of decisions that, you know, I was saying, oh, no, you know, that that's not how you should be doing it. And yet, uh, with, uh, with me, yes, I, I handled that differently. So I, I, I'm grateful. I'm glad I didn't wait any longer, because I do think, um, especially with teenagers, and, you know, because just those are big issues anyway, but, but even mm -hmm. with little kids. And, you know, again, I had no background at that point in psychology, social services, you know, I, I dove into all kinds of books and, and reading and that kind of informed my thinking and, oh, you know, I, I probably shouldn't be handling it that way. And, and really, for all the all these reasons, you know, the kids who lose someone to stigmatized deaths, you know, suicide, homicide, drug overdose, you know, those are the kids that I hold most deeply in my heart simply because the stigma just makes it so, you know, talking about death and loss is so hard to begin with. And those stigmas just amplify mm. the difficulty of those conversations um, or the disappearance of supporters, you know, by, you know, a hundredfold. So, yeah, um, yeah. It's, uh, hopefully I will never have to go through a similar situation again, because I would give, give very different advice, uh, this, this time around. Right. Right. Well, thank you for, for sharing all that with us. Cause I think it's very important for people to hear, um, you know, your experience with this and, and, uh, yeah. So thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to follow up on, you kind of alluded to that. I, I don't remember exactly what you said, but you know, before your husband died, you mentioned there were starting to be some problems. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yes. And that I think was what for me kind of brought into the most stark reality that Katerina's and my grief journeys were very different. You know, I had actually been contemplating asking for a divorce. Mm. So in my mind, I was already working through a lot of, you know, the separation issues. You know, we hadn't talked to Katerina about it. Um, he really did not want a divorce. And then suddenly when he's died, 
you know, probably um, in part, at least in my mind, partly because I wanted to leave, you know, I felt that there was this direct correlation between my wanting to leave and his death. Mm. So, you know, survivors of suicide have all kinds of issues with feeling responsible and, you know, they, you know, it's their fault or they could have done something differently. So if that's the norm, I I felt like I felt that like a thousand times because, you Uh. know, in my mind, there was a very clear correlation, like this is my fault on some Mm. level. And then, Mm. so how do I even begin to have that conversation with the child of the person who has died. You know, I could barely, I mean, it took me sort of years to figure out that conversation in my own head, much less try to figure out how how do I begin to explain that to her? And in the middle of all that too, there was what I felt suddenly had become my job was to curate her dad for her. Oh, tell us more about that you know, what was he like? Um, What did he struggle with? What didn't he struggle with? You know, what, um, you know, who was he as a person? Because she was pretty young. And over the years, you know, she would forget details. And I remember thinking, you know, very clearly, I feel like I'm the last person who should be the curator of Ah. this person's identity. Like I, you know, partly at the beginning, like, I don't deserve to be this person, this is all my fault anyway, or, you know, over time, like, I have conflicting feelings about him, I have very ambivalent feelings at at moments. So, again, am I doing him justice to her, because Mm. she deserves that, you know, the kids always need to love their parent, uh, no matter how imperfect, uh, or what, whatever they might have struggled with. Um, so suddenly I just felt very alone and, oh, this is all left up to me. It's not a job I want. I, I don't know. You know, I've clearly failed at the job of being a wife. And, you know, now I have to, you know, figure out how to navigate this for her in a way that lets her have a relationship, you know, with her father and mm. the mostly positive one. And that's something... So I struggle with that a lot simply because, um, you know, and I, and I will say I also have a special place in my heart for uh, people with complicated grief. I've, I've had another loss since then, my mom's unexpected death that hit me in a very different way. And, and that I would say was just the pure devastating grief. And of the two, I, they were horrible, both of them, but I, I feel like I would take the, the pure grief over the complicated grief any day uh, because the, the complicated grief is just that. I mean, there's still aspects of, you know, what happened almost 10 years ago now, but, you know, I'm just still slowly unpacking um, and both for me and then for Katerina. Again, she, you know, you've, I know on past episodes, you've talked to folks about regrieving deaths at different developmental stages. And I definitely saw that, um, you know, with her and her dad. And so, you know, as she's regrieving, it sort of opens it all back up. And, you know, am I further away enough now where I can narrate this in a more helpful way for her or disclose, Uh, you know, and especially because he had clearly struggled with depression, you know, how, how do I present that compassionately and also accurately to her right, in a way right. that still lets her love and have a relationship with her dad. Right. I, you know, again, you'll talk to her. I, I, of the widowed parenting spectrum of activities, this is probably the stuff I feel maybe that I've done the least good job at, <laughs> but I also feel like it's the, the hardest part. And, you know, yeah. I we talk openly. I'm like, I, I am doing my, you know, my best. And, and I worry, I think she's still, you know, she's still angry at her dad at times. Um, mm. And, you know, especially since she's become a teenager, that's come up a little more. Um, some of the things she's been doing recently that she can tell you about in terms of her own advocacy and volunteer work, I think is healing that. Um, I'm I'm seeing seeing a change. But again, partly I worry, you know, how much of my experience is coloring her experience with that. Yeah. 
Well, so speaking of, okay, so your experience and her experience. So you mentioned in the, in the beginning, she was five and he died. And at that point, she didn't know that you guys had been talking about divorce, right? Right. So she probably had no idea that there were these underlying issues. It sounds like it would kind of complicate the way things kind of unfolded from there on out. Yes. Yes. It did feel murky. Um, She, you know, we really rarely have ever fought and she claims she remembers this big fight, but again, our our memories of this are very different because it was probably like the one fight, you know, we ever had actually, you know, that she would have even overheard. Um, And, you know, and her narrative is you guys were fighting all the time. And I'm like, literally it was like one time. Uh Um, So you know, kids are so intuitive. And that that was the other thing, you know, kind of related to the suicide discussion, you know, they always know so much more than you think they do. Mm. Um, and, and that, you know, really was just weighing on me. I'm like, she's a smart kid, she's gonna, you know, figure, figure this out. Um, so but yeah, so it did it. I think when you're not fully open with the facts, you know, then you're getting into who knows what, what nuance have I shared, you know, mm. up to this point. Um, and that just makes a very difficult job, you know, being a present parent, like a hundred times harder. Um, so yeah. It, it, and again, it may still be why some of her impressions of what were happening were different than mine. I, she did say at the time, and will still say sometimes, like, I never saw you sad or you weren't grieving in the same way that I was. And, and that's true. You know, partly I, I was doing that thing that maybe is also not great, you know, at the, at the beginning, shielding her for my grieving. I kind of saved that for after, after she went to bed. But partly, you know, mine was uh, grieving, but so much more just trying to figure out sort of what is my role in this. And also then the kind of the public private life, you know, when people don't know it's a suicide and they assume like, I'm just this grieving widow and everyone's like, you must miss him so much. Hmm. And, you know, part of me is like, I had just been in the middle of like, there was a weird feeling and I, you know, probably sounds shocking to maybe people who haven't been through this, there was an element of relief, which again, then I feel awful even acknowledging, you know, that I, I felt that. So, you know, none of that was stuff I was going to unpack with a five and six year old, you know, because again, I was barely sort of getting my, my head around it. But, you know, I have in the repeat conversations over time, tried to unpack more of that, but at the same time, you know, I'm still operating from the place where he's her dad. She got a lot of incredible qualities from him. And that's, that's what I want to emphasize for her. You know, mm. I don't want to withhold, you know, the, the things he struggled with because that was clearly, you know, part of him, but I, I don't want to emphasize that either. Right. But again, right. it goes back to that job of, you know, I'm his curator and historian uh, and, you know, again, only feeling marginally good about that uh, at different moments, you know, how I am doing at that job. And I I do think that's where friends and family uh, of a person who's died can kind of come in. Uh, You know, for us, he was not in touch with his biological family. Um, I, I think a lot of his friends, honestly, were probably pretty angry with me. Um, because I, you know, I have a feeling, um, you know, they too agreed that this was, you know, my fault in some ways. So, so it was harder to rope in those community people to help, uh, um, you know, talk to her about, mm. you know, who he was too. And, and in an ideal world, you know, you have a lot of those people around who can, can help with that. Um, so it may have been just particular to our situation, but it felt very lonely in that, you know, we were kind of geographically isolated and then, you know, for other reasons, isolated. Um, And again, I felt like the outward persona and who I was out in the community, you know, with people making assumptions about, you know, what, how I was feeling was also at odds, you know, with what was actually going on inside my head and heart. And I think that compounded uh, some of it too. Yeah. So no, that sounds incredibly hard. Someone comes up to you in the grocery store and says, Oh, I'm so sorry. You must miss him so much. Yeah. And you're saying, uh, 
what do I say? I have to be nice. I don't really want to go there with this person or not right now. Right. Maybe my daughter's next to me in the grocery cart, like overhearing, yes. you know? Yes. It just, oh, it's, it's interesting talking about all this again, because, you know, there I'm thinking back, I'm like, how the heck did I even <laughs> hold it together? Yeah. Literally. Yeah. That. I, I did have, uh, I will say, I very distinctly remember the, the grief brain, but it was interesting because I could hold it together. So I was running, you know, a nonprofit. I'm responsible for the livelihood of, you know, 18 other employees at work. That was like my safe place. Everything was totally fine. It was all together focused. I would literally come home and I could not finish a sentence. Uh, I, you know, I, I would get half a sentence out and then Katerina would just sit there and look at me <laughs> and be like, is this the word you're looking for? Or she would just start finishing all of my right. sentences. Like, <laughs> My brain had just like, it, it could hold it together for the right. eight, nine hours and right. then it was done. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I feel bad that Katerina was not getting, you know, th those best parts of me. Uh, but also, you know, we kind of had this reverse situation where Bill had been the house husband, uh, you know, for several mm -hmm. years. But then suddenly, you know, I'm in charge of cooking and finding, you know, the, the babysitters. I had this whole matrix. Of, <laughs> I had to have the high school kids and the college kids because their vacation schedules were different. And then I had a uh, back for each and always an additional person in training kind of who I could call, you know, in a pinch and uh -huh. I had to travel for work and, you know, just having this like, you know, it was taking a village, but a village of people I was trying to, you know, cobble together and, and pay. Um, and then there were moments I got stuck out of town once during an ice storm. And, you know, the, the uh -huh. babysitter, this is like, this is when I decided to move back to Kentucky. The babysitter who was staying with Katerina while I was out of town was going on spring break. Uh -huh. And so I literally, you know, I'm in this hotel room in New York. I'm trying to, you know, figure out what to do. And I just call, you know, her best friend's mother. And I'm like, can you literally just pick up my child? Like, I don't know what else to do. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Can you just go get her and I'll be home maybe in a day or two, you know, with <laughs> all the ice melts, uh, you know, and, uh -huh. and that was kind of the moment because you know we'd been doing this for about three years at that point i'm like all right that's it i can yeah <laughs> not do that anymore. i have to move back closer to, to family so yeah uh, so you moved back to kentucky and so your mom was there then and other people <laughs> and did your mom then end up um becoming a big part of your, probably your family's day-to-day -day life. It really did. And, and really for immediately after Bill's death, um, you know, she would come for visits. Uh, we would spend a couple weeks in the summers and, you know, holiday breaks with her. So she was really kind of Katerina's backup person. I mm -hmm. remember right after Bill died, we had to, I had to, she was very concerned as many bereaved kids are, you know, what if something happened to me? So we had to put yes. together a sheet of the call list, like go across the street to the Miss Lisa, if Miss Lisa's at home, you know, call go to this person, you know, and here's how we use the phone and, you know, calling. And my mom was sort of the, the chief person on that list. So we moved back. Katerina spent, you know, tons of time with her. She would do pickups, came to, you know, school performances. Still a lot of the time, you know, when I couldn't go, you know, she had my mom there. Mm. Um, and so we had two really wonderful years with her. And then mom went in for a routine laparoscopic hernia surgery and a couple of surgical mistakes later, you know, she dies uh, oh. after, oh, after no. two days. So, you know, again, that was all, uh, you know, my, my very first instinct was we've done this grief rodeo before, you know, we, we know how it goes. We'll be fine. Right. And then like within two days, I'm like just falling apart. I'm like, oh no, this is a, I, I understood the lesson that each loss is different. Uh, <laughs> you know? And weirdly, this felt devastating more immediately to me. I, I feel like with the suicide death, you know, it was so much to take in. I could literally sense my brain protecting me. You know, mm. it would only let, like it, it was a very long processing of that grief. I think because there was so much, uh, it's like my brain knew, uh, you know, this is the way to keep her from having a total nervous breakdown. You know, she has to be functional. So we're just going to do little bits of it at a time over a long time. 
kind of with my mom, it just immediately felt horrible. Um, and Katerina struggled more overtly with my mom's death, which had also just happened to coincide with her starting to re do the developmentally do reprocessing of her dad's death. Uh, Wait, how old was she at this point? <clears throat> so she died? was 12, turned 13 a few days after, um, okay. or turned 12, I guess, a few days after her mom died. So she, you know, the three or four months before, like had already just, I could tell was struggling with her dad was really angry. Um, there was a, it was winter and I went out and she was just pounding the side of the house with snowballs, and just, you know, yelling and just for like 30 minutes. And I was like, Whoa, what is going on here? Cause usually, you know, that was not her at all. And I'm like, I feel like something's going on here. And it was funny. She had just remembered that like six months before we had forgotten to celebrate her dad's birthday. Cause oh. usually we'd always do a cake. And then suddenly this, this is in December. She's like, you didn't tell me we didn't do the cake. And then she's, you know, oh, mashing the snowballs from the six months like, before. Right. Well, so this is, wait, this is interesting. Let me just pause you for a second. Cause I think yeah. some people worry, right? Like, should I remind my kids that, that, <laughs> you know, that it's an important birthday or a death anniversary or something significant, or maybe if I don't remind them, they won't notice, or maybe they were young or that. So this sounds like this <laughs> backfired. <laughs> All I will say is literally I've handled it both ways and neither way has felt good to her. Uh, uh -huh. It's like sometimes it was the right thing to do. Other times, absolutely not. Uh, uh -huh. So how, and I, 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 we did that very religiously, probably in the first three or four years after Bill's death, you know, we'd do a birthday cake uh, on his birthday. And then on the, anniversary of his death and I and she probably wants to tell you about uh tell me about what we did for that because that that was good and very meaningful I think for for both of us but I was very intentional about that and then over time um you know his birthday fell always like when we we're on vacation and so I'm mm. like you know if we're on in the middle of this great vacation do I want to wreck this vibe you know that we're yeah. off having fun you know yeah. with birthday and I think that's a real question Yes, I think I had taken her to Paris or something. I mean, this was like a big trip, you know, we'd been planning. And so I, I, I think I did tell her, but again, she would say I didn't. Uh, so, but that's all what came up literally, you know, six months later and six years after he died. I mean, so the, one of the things I'm sure all of the widowed parents listening to this, you know, come to understand is you are never done with this. Um, and that, that was sort of the early heaviest realization. It was maybe three or four months after he died. I remember I was sitting in a psychiatrist's office and I was talking to her about how do I curate him? What story do I tell? You know, all that. And I remember she said, well, you'll, you'll feel differently about this in 10 years. And I remember it was literally like someone had just dropped a piano on me because that was the first time it entered my brain. Again, we are never done. This is an ongoing conversation for the rest of both of our, our lives. And at that moment, I distinctly did not want that. Uh, but, you know, also it's like that that's also just how it goes. Um, yeah. Wow. So, that's such an important point. Thank you for articulating that. That's yeah. And I don't think it's that's I don't think that's obvious, right? Like you kind of if you're new into this and you're like, okay, like when when does this end? When when are when are we? You know, when can we? When are we? When are we fine? When are we back to normal? Or when I don't know what you know, but yeah, no, I I hate to you know be the bearer of news for people at that early raw, um, and because that I I you know even almost ten years later I re literally remember me sitting in that chair in that office and mm. how heavy <clears throat> that felt just that understanding that this is a, a conversation and, and and now thinking ten years later almost you know she was right it does evolve over time and it feels less heavy and the more you talk about it it just becomes part of the conversation but there are moments like the snowball moment where you're sort of surprised depending on where sort of your child is in this by the renewed intensity and it may be you know three five seven years out but to them 
you know, in that moment, it is just as fresh somehow, mm. um, you know, as they're re- reworking through some yeah. of that. You know, on the, what I'm hearing in all this, you know, by way of encouragement, maybe to listeners, I'm hearing how wonderful it is that, you know, after working, you know, all these complications and anger and problems and uncertainties and all these things, you guys now sounds to me like are talking openly and honestly, and are going back and having some of these difficult conversations and, and not running away from them. You know, yes. maybe it's taken 10 years to get here. <laughs> but how wonderful, you know, that you've gotten to that point. No, I, I would say that, you know, there are many gifts of grief, you know, that you come over time to appreciate. And I think the relationship she and I have and just our willingness to talk about hard things has been one of the very best gifts. And I, I think this, it was after my mom's death, because both of us, again, were just, you know, struggling so much after that, um, that, you know, we went to family therapy, you know, she, I knew I, I wanted to get her individual help because she was struggling, especially more in school than she had, um, you know, after, after her dad's death. Um, but they, they sent us first to family therapy, which, you know, at first I'm like, come on, she needs a trauma therapist. Like, why are we in family therapy? And of course, you know, now <laughs> we joke, we're like, that was the greatest thing uh, that we, that we ever did. Um, I, I feel like this journey has let me be a completely different parent to her than mm-hmm. I would have been probably. And I used to fear, I remember a thing when she was little, I'm like, Oh God, I fear the teenage years. I'm just turning her over to her dad. You know, she can argue with the best of them. You know, I'm going to be no match. It'll be awful. And that none of that has turned out to be true. I think because of kind of the work we put in, I, re- I remember I'd taken her for her annual uh, physical and, and this was, maybe right before, right after my mom died. And the doctor was giving me a hard time. He's like, what do you mean you haven't had the sex talk with her? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, look, I've tried. She thinks it's gross. She doesn't want any, anything to do with that conversation. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, I felt like he was kind of beating up on me and he, you know, whisked out of the room. He was busy. And then I realized what I wanted to say to him was, buddy, when you've had the, your dad died by suicide talk with your child, <laughs> I will have the sex talk, the drugs talk, the alcohol talk any day of the week. Like those uh-huh. are easy conversations in uh-huh. comparison. So I, I do feel like it changed the metric for, you know, what was a hard conversation and pretty much there are not a lot of hard conversations, uh, you know, that, that go in league, you know, with what we'd already, already been through. So I do love that we can talk about all of, all of that stuff um, and that she feels empowered to. And now, especially as a teenager that, you know, she'll keep me honest and push me, uh, you know, when she thinks I'm shying away, you know, from, from something. Um, so yeah, that that's been unexpected and really wonderful. Yeah. Terrific. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that too. Um, I was thinking about the grief centers, the grief support, the whatever you mentioned in Mississippi, you had a kids yes. and family grief center that both of you went to. Yes. And then by the time your mom died, you were in Kentucky and was, there wasn't something like that there that you guys could go was to? Nothing. And, and that sort of was what made me realize Katerina really was able to articulate, you know, at, kids at 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, their friends are who are so important to them. And when you've, you know, lost somebody important, you know, she just would come home and say like, I can't, there's nobody I can talk to about this. You know, my friends don't get it. They're uncomfortable. Mm. It's funny. They're still a little uncomfortable, even, you know, her talking about her dad's death and she's very comfortable talking about that, but just, you know, unless you're in a kind of the safe space of a room of other grieving teenagers or, or kids, um, you know, it's hard to have those conversations. So after kind of watching what she was struggling with, um, I, after, um, I, right about a year after my mom died, I quit my job. I've never quit anything in my life. And everyone's like, Ooh, so brave. And I thought, <laughs> I don't, you know, literally this is the only thing that makes sense to me right now. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I knew by that point I wanted to 
start this grief center. And honestly, I wanted more time with Katerina. She was still, you know, really struggling. And I was just really worried for her. And I remember saying to myself, I can always get another job. I can always get and not always get another child. You know, I have to, I have to be more available um, for her, but it gave me the time to kind of do the groundwork uh, for the center, which, you know, it was, it was very clear to me why she needed that, you know, as a teenager. So I, I feel, I don't know if lucky is probably not the right word, but I've had the experience of seeing, you know, both the grief journey from a uh, young school age child now you know a teenager how those are, are different what they want as support is different um and and compounding you know with teenagers i think it's a little harder trying to figure out uh you know what are normal kid behaviors and mm. what are grief behaviors um mm. i felt mm. like that was much easier when she was younger, you know, it was very, one of my favorite moments from the adult support group in Mississippi. So, so a parent asked this question, they're like, I feel bad, you know, making them do chores. They've already had so much loss, you know, and, and the facilitator just looked at us and she goes, kids are little sociopaths. They will take any opening available to them. You know, rules are more, you know, I mean, and she was laughing and meant it kindly. And, and I, you know, went on to say like the rules and the structure are even more important now than they were before, even mm -hmm. though it feels harder somehow. And my mom and I actually had uh, some discussions about that because she, you know, she would say like, come on, just, you know, she could stay up later, or, you know, she's uh -huh. lost her dad, like, don't, you know, don't make uh -huh. her do this stuff or, you know, be nicer. And partly and I was like, you know, her, her world has exploded. But she also, it's, it's good for her to know that some things are still the same, you know, and <laughs> unfortunately, those are usually the boring rules or chores or, or all that kind of thing, you know, so, but with, with older teens, you know, what they want of you and how they want to be supported, as with so many other things with them, it could change literally week to week, day to day. Um, so I, I think as a parent, you know, you have to be even more on your toes to kind of pivot, you know, mm. is today the day they want to talk about it more or is today the day their brain's feeling like they're overwhelmed and they just don't want to deal with it right now, you know, which is it? And it could be different, you know, from morning to when you pick them up from school. Uh, right. Right. So yeah, that, that's one of the, the challenges. So also I think, you know, partly what, why I wanted to have this grief center is I know, you know, how hard it was for me to try to figure out those things. And I was keenly aware that I was a lucky griever in terms of, you know, I had education and resources and, you know, I could hire people to drive her to her dance lessons and things like that. So, and if it was that hard for me to navigate all those mm. things and mm. get mental health supports, you know, for her, how was it for people who didn't have those things? Um, so yeah. that, <laughs> that really, um, that sticks with me a, a lot. And just watching how her school experience unfolded, um, you know, when we lost my mom when she was in middle school and how really difficult that was and how it was not uniformly handled very well at the school level. And I just kept thinking, Again, if we're having this bad a time of it, I can only imagine, yeah, you know, the other kids whose parents are, you know, don't feel comfortable calling up the school counselor and saying, you know, what this is what is happening and it's not okay. You right. Know, I want right. a 504 or, you know, right. I, I want to do that. So, you know, being able to establish a place where, you know, we can talk to parents about what grief looks like, you know, what what you're seeing the normal abnormal, um, you know, so many things that, you know, pre loss would be behaviors for like, Oh, something is deeply wrong. But then in the context of loss, they're totally normal behaviors. So mm. just no way, you know, having that information just, I think makes the parenting a little bit easier. You know, you're not, you know, you get a better sense of what should I be alarmed about and what is just part of the territory. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, good. That's yeah. That's all really important stuff. And gosh, I think that you said about five different things that I could take this discussion in five different directions next, and I'm trying to decide which way to go with it. <laughs> I think one of the things you mentioned was trying to how difficult it is to navigate the the landscape of getting support for your kid. You know. Yes. Yeah. And that was really very hard. Um, here, I mean, I literally had to call in a favor from a friend, you know, at the university who was connected to even get an appointment with an adolescent psychiatrist. Um, mm. You know, I talk to parents now who say sometimes the wait is two or more months, you know, for an initial assessment. Mm. Um you know, and, and talking through, you know, medication, she was so anxious. She literally could not stay in school, you know, a full week. It was like two, three days a week. She's calling me. She has a migraine, stomach ache, you know, come pick me up. Um, and, you know, partly to the, to her psychiatrist, I'm like, we just have to figure out a way, you know, to keep her in school. And so we tried medication and the medications of course come with their own, drawbacks and she experienced sort of all of the negative side effects you can have from those. And thankfully, you know, I'd done a lot of reading um, and I knew to be on the lookout for them, but they, they even kind of snuck up and suddenly one day, you know, I'm like, this does not look like my child. And finally, thankfully we could communicate well enough. She's like, mom, I don't feel anything. I'm like, oh no, this is bad. <laughs> you know, I knew mm. that was not what needed to, to be happening. You know, I, we, I was not trying to medicate her out of those feelings. Um, and, you know, and I literally had to call up the psychiatrist and say like, please, you know, take her off this right now. And I wanted to see a trauma therapist, you know, so it was frustrating to me that I felt like, I was having to direct, and this was a very, you know, I'm not knocking the psychiatrist, she's very good, but I also, I guess I didn't expect the level to which I was going to be having to directly advocate or mm. come into the office with, here is what I think the best solution is for this. Because you um, feel like they're the professionals, they should, right? They should tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you know, and I, I am not shy about uh, about doing that sort of stuff. But at the same time, I also realize they've got a lot more education and experience than I do. But the flip side is, you know, I am the expert in my child, so it's it's trying to find out what's the what's the happy medium sort of between those two mm. things. Um, and again, I think, you know, not. Every child who's had a loss, you know, needs individual therapy, though both my daughter and I are huge proponents of therapy, um, you know, because I think regardless of what you're working on in therapy, you know, there are just so many living skills that you can acquire and perfect through yeah, therapeutic yeah. experiences. Um, and I think that's maybe kind of what we both leaned into is, is trying to use these as opportunities to just figure out you know, how do we live happier with ourselves and in the world um, using the springboard of working, you know, through our losses to, to acquire those skills and outlooks. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it, it was a surprise, well, I don't know, surprisingly hard um, to, to try to navigate, you know, exactly what kinds of, of help. And, you know, it, it felt, like a variation on what I was having to do with the school, uh, very much be an advocate for her sort of all the time, every year, every new set of teachers, every counselors. And, you know, when um, we lost my mom, you know, the, the teachers would say like, well, wasn't this just her grandma? You know, doesn't yeah. most middle school kids lose a grandmother or a grandparent at some point? Like, why right. is this so devastating to her? Um, you know, wasn't it a few months ago? Like why is that literally, you know, people would say, you know, you should be over that now, right, you know, right. all, all of that very unhelpful narrative. And so then I would have to go into, you know, well, actually it was preceded by a very traumatic, you know, death by suicide of her dad, you know, it's keen right. into, you know, there was so much psychoeducation. I was trying to pack into like a five minute interaction with this <laughs> teacher. Right. And, you know, half the time the teachers are like, are you just trying to make excuses for her? Or, uh, and, and I think that, 
you know, many of them viewed it as that, like, you know, I was just making an excuse or she was just making an excuse. And that, that was the other impetus, I think, behind my realizing, you know, why this grief center is so important and why our outreach and work in the schools is so important is because she, you know, this kid who's coming to this loss as the straight A student, you know, is coming home with C's in homeroom, literally. Mm. And I would say like, what is going on? This is a homeroom. She's like, right. mom, I, why do I do this homework? Everybody dies. You know? yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I couldn't argue with her. I'm right. like, I'm in the same place. Uh, right. Yes, I, I totally get that. But I have to try to make these teachers understand, you know, this in a, in a little bit different way. And I saw that they just kind of wrote her off. And again, I thought, if this is the kid who normally is going to get any benefit of the doubt that is available to them, if this is her experience, again, the kids who don't come into this kind of scenario, you know, with all that credit built up, I right. guess, with the, or the school, right. you know, what, again, what, how are they going to get through this? So, yeah, sure. um, you know, I feel like as much as I can do just to, you know, empower the parents and, and change the culture in the schools. I mean, I think this is a very interesting time to begin work. You know, we are talking about grief and loss due to COVID. You know, those are words that are much more in our vocabulary uh, than they were. Right. You know, All of a sudden, so many more people ago. are thinking about grief and loss and kids and grief and schools and, and everything else. Yes. So, you know, in a way, I feel like this is the amazing moment to just, you know, get in there, guns, guns blazing. My, my daughter looked at me one day. She's like, Mom, the school district just does not know what they've gotten into with you today. <laughs> I was like, no, they do not. <laughs> but it's all good. I promise. You know, I, that is I, so I, funny. <laughs> yes, well, she, she again will we'll call me on all that. But, but I feel, again, excited about that work um, because... Uh, you know, it's it's a way to advocate. Uh, you know, we both she and I have come to a lot of this knowledge through very you know hard hard won experience. And I, I remember distinctly thinking, you know, if I've had to learn to like how to do all this stuff and how to think about all this stuff, like I want to put it to use. Uh, you yeah. Know, so to make somebody else's way hopefully a little bit easier. Yeah. Gosh, I think we could keep talking about this all day. And I'm thinking we're going to have a Salisbury family part three here. I think we might have to invite you back because there's a number of topics that we haven't gotten to. And I think some of the, the post-traumatic growth and how these you know, dual grief experiences, how they may or may not have changed you. Um, and other thing, I just think there's like, at least several more topics we could talk about. So I think we're going to oh, put a I pin would, in that for today. <laughs> yes, I would love it. Again, um, you know, it, this has opened up, you know, a new world, both professionally and personally for me. And again, not, you know, my, my life unfolded in a way I absolutely did not expect, but I'm very grateful also for many parts of it. So I, I love having these conversations and just the space, I guess that's something I did not expect. The, the space of loss is so inviting and filled with such amazing people. Uh, mm. I've met so many people, um, you know, who really, it just warms my heart to be in conversation with them and to talk about things that feel meaningful and, you know, really, um, you know, are life shaping. And so that, that feels like a big gift. So yeah. I'm happy to, to do that anytime. Good. Great. Great. Well, before I ask my wrap up question that I always like to end with, I do want to hear for listeners who may be in your area in Lexington, Kentucky, um, tell us a little bit about your grief center and what's coming. Sure. So um, we are in central Kentucky right now. We're going to be starting grief support groups in eight schools in our district. But my hope is to you know, expand that out. Uh, ultimately, I want to see community based groups all over the state. Um, you know, the, the areas of the most loss in Kentucky are actually rural areas as opposed to urban areas. So I want to figure out a way to get support groups going there. Where uh, my daughter and I are uh, participating in a pilot with the University of Chicago Med School. It's a peer to peer uh, virtual grief curriculum. So actually, that's a way 
I'm hoping by beginning of, you know, end of this year, early 22, to be able to offer virtual groups for teens. Um, and my daughter wow. will be leading those. And Ooh, so I want to hear love, all about that. We need to have another yeah, side can, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> She'll have a lot to tell you. It is, it's an amazing curriculum. And I love, you know, that is one of the benefits of COVID that this, because of when it was developed, it was done virtually. And, you know, mm. sometimes virtual groups, you know, less good than others, but this was designed for this and I think is really good. And what it allows us to do is to be serving kids in rural communities and all yeah. parts of the state, you know, yeah. much sooner. So, sure, sure. so our, our website, uh, www www.kcgcf.org. Um, and, you know, I would love to start community-based groups. And so, you know, we're just going to build things as fast as we can raise the money uh, to, to expand. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing it. It just, it feels incredibly exciting to get started. Um, yeah. Yes. Good. Well, we'll put the link in the show notes for sure. KCGCF, that's the Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families. So the initial mm-hmm. dot, yeah. dot org, you dot said? Dot org. Dot mm-hmm. org. Okay, dot great. Org. Good. Okay, well, let's wrap up with my favorite question to ask at the end here. If you could say yeah. one thing to newly widowed parents, what would you say to them? Oh, I, I would say you will get through this. There are a lot of, a lot of moments that you don't know how you will get through it, but you will. And I, I will say kind of in companion to that, doing the work of grief, both your own work and grieving intentionally with your children is the hugest gift that you can give them. I, I sat in that adult support group with a lot of adults who had also had a loss as, as children and to a person, they all said, you know, my person died. We literally never talked about it again, Mm. you know? And, and then they would say, and I realized I never dealt with any of that. And now I'm sitting here in this room, 20, 15, 20, 30 years later, and now I'm having to deal with it. So I, I, you know, grief is so hard and isolating, but it it can also bring you close together with your kids in a way that, you know, it would have been hard to imagine before. It can be a a uniting and and one of the more meaningful things I think that you can do as a family, even though that that sounds kind of odd, but I think your, your listeners will understand. I am incredibly grateful to be having that ongoing conversation with my daughter. And that, that's been a, a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Well, I think that's a great place to end. So my guest today is Leela Salisbury, founder and director of the Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families. So Leela, tell us again, the website where people can find uh, your, your organization. Sure. It's www.kcgcf.org. Okay, fantastic. Well, Leela, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. This was wonderful. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Leela Salisbury as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 107. And remember, it is Children's Grief Awareness Month, and I have a terrific giveaway going on this week. If you're listening in real time, it's Uh, Wednesday, November 10th, as this episode is dropping. Um, So if you do hear this before Friday the 12th at 11 o'clock Pacific time, uh, terrific giveaway, jennylisk.com slash giveaway is where you enter. There are five books, signed copies of each of them. Um, Three of them are books. One is Past and Present by Alison Gilbert. Terrific book. I interviewed her um, back in episode, well, it was in September of, of, uh, 2019, uh, and then Never the Same by Donna Sherman, which is about better understanding the perspectives of kids who've lost a parent and uh, grieving children, um, Future Widow, which is my book, And then the last two books are more like workbooks. One is for teens. It's from the Dougie Center, and it's called Deconstruction slash Reconstruction, a teen journal. And the other one is from the National Alliance for Children's Grief, and it's called When Someone Dies, and it is a child caregiver activity book. 
So that one's more for younger kids, and the journal uh, is for teens, and then three books for um, for you. So I hope you will enter. It's a giveaway. Free uh, One winner will win a free copy of each of those books. Uh, JennyLisk.com slash giveaway is the place to enter for that. And like I said, it ends at 11 o'clock Pacific time on Friday evening, the 12th of November. Okay, um, look for part two of the Salisbury family next week with Leela's daughter, Katerina. She's 15 years old, and she and I had a terrific discussion. I can't wait to bring you that next week. Um, In the meantime, remember to check out the giveaway. And also, if you'd like, you can head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash widowed parent if you'd like to support the podcast. I've had um, several folks, several listeners actually go in just in the last week or so here and um, buy five coffees uh, for me from that site, which is terrific. I love coffee. In fact, I went today to Starbucks and um, enjoyed a special treat there from a listener's generosity. So thank you to those of you who've chipped in and uh, head on over there if you'd like to support the podcast. Okay, that's all for this week. As always, thank you for listening. And until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.